If you remember sniping battle droids, dogfighting over Bespin, and hunting down Gungans, then you grew up playing the original Star Wars Battlefront, which turns 20 this year. And so in this video, I wanted to revisit this classic shooter to see if it still holds up. But first, let's set the scene. The year was 2002, and Pandemic Studios, who were best known for developing the Clone Wars game in addition to several RTS games, had set out to create the self-proclaimed ultimate Star Wars fan's dream game. Inspired by the the likes of Battlefield 1942, the developers wanted to create an online shooter for both console and PC which would allow for team strategy and would feature battles and worlds from across the entire saga. The developers even went as far as to outline the five core must-do principles for the game. The game had to be balanced, it had to encourage team play while having a fun single player mode, it had to fulfill the Star Wars fantasy, and finally you must be able to kill Ewoks and Gungans. Star Wars Battlefront would be announced in January of 2004, and was presented as LucasArts' big AAA holiday launch title for that year, so naturally a large marketing campaign followed. The highlight of which was the playable Xbox demo baked into the Star Wars trilogy DVD. Unfortunately, those of us with a PlayStation 2 had to fork out £5.50 for an issue of the official magazine with the demo disc. I remember reading this preview and being so excited. Wait, what's that? The spoiler for the entirety of Revenge of the Sith a year before release? Never mind, that just don't look at it. The original Battlefront would go on to sell 4 million copies, receive critical acclaim, and spawn an entire series of games. But that was two decades ago, so how does it hold up now? Well, let's start it up and find out. Now, even though Battlefront had a strong emphasis on multiplayer, most of us who got this game on Christmas of 2004 would go straight to the single player campaign, which was designed to get you familiar with both the gameplay mechanics and all the playable maps. So let's start there. Ah, uh, just take a moment to listen to this. The campaign battles unfold chronologically, which means we start with the first big battle of the saga on the plains of Naboo. So, do we play as the brave Gungans against the evil battle droids? No, you play as the droids wiping out every last Gungan. Looks like the developers were serious about that last principle, hey? I never knew battle droids could crawl until I played this game, and there's something very wrong about this. So the poor Gungans don't have blasters or anything, they just throw these grenades. Come on, hit me! Although I must say the droids aren't much better. Well, come on, move! Is it, is it scared? I'm also pretty sure there are no droids inside the shield generators. The Gungans are just wiping each other out with their own grenades. Also, I don't think the ones on the Kadus do anything. They're just sent into battle to die. In my first playthrough of this level, I didn't even fire a single shot and the Gungans still lost. I know that tutorial levels are supposed to ease you into the game, but come on. Wow, a droid on a Kadu. This really is the ultimate Star Wars experience. Oh look, it's the waterfall where Anakin first confessed his extreme political beliefs to Padme. Still work though. Okay, easy, easy. What? Oh, thanks a lot, Tank. I almost had him. Oh look, his mate's trying to get revenge. Oh no, the dinosaur is down, not the dinosaur. The next level continues the battle for Naboo, this time moving into the city of Thieb. And this is the first proper level in the campaign. All these years later, the gameplay feels simple at first. Two factions fighting over a bunch of command posts spread across the map. You win either by defeating all the enemies, or taking over all their command posts. It's simple, but provides an incredibly fun sandbox that gives way more options than just your regular shooter. Add a few vehicles in there, plus a selection of class types, and you're rolling. Speaking of which, we can play as these bad boys now. Hehehe, <laughs> you're no match for me, Captain Panakas. Hey, watch where you're driving! The droidicas aren't perfect though. For example, they don't have the best turning circle, and for some reason break into pieces as soon as you set foot into water. Uh, you guys carry on, I'm just gonna take a quick droid nap. The campaign then expands to the EU with a mission on Kashyyyk, and uh, this first Kashyyyk level kind of looks like Vietnam from Apocalypse Now. Unlike the Gungans, the Wookiees are a lot more competent in combat. You can now also play as the super battle droids and fly the starfighters. The levels in this first game are quite varied when it comes to ground combat, however most of them are a bit too small for starfighters. Oh nice, look it's Count Dooku with his hunched back and pink lightsaber. Well, are we gonna do something or just stand there getting shot by Wookiees? 
Okay, next up is the start of the Clone Wars with the Battle of Geonosis. And this is where the game really heats up. Sure, this Geonosis does look pretty sparse when compared against the cinematics from the movie, but you get to play as five different clone types with dropships, walkers which act as command posts, and a helping hand from Mace Windu himself. The Jedi are invincible in this game and, unfortunately, non-playable. And they're not very bright. Look at Mace trying to figure out how to get to that droid on the ledge. Also, what's wrong with his face? Is he smiling? In addition to the shooting, the driving of vehicles, and the manning of turrets, you can also give one of four commands to your fellow soldiers, which adds some nice basic strategic elements to the game. Would anyone else just give up and respawn whenever they found themselves too far away from the action? Ugh, sudden heart attack. Next up, we have Camino. Ah, the home turf. This should be easy. Enemy forces have captured a command post. Enemy forces have captured a command. Enemy forces have captured a command post. Ah, crap. And this was one of those open levels where you and your friends would always end up sniping each other or overestimate the jet trooper's abilities. <laughs> And speaking of classes, there are five basic ones in this game. Each of the four factions will have an infantry, a heavy, a pilot, a sniper, and then a special which is different for each faction. Okay, next up we have the Ice Planet of Renvar. And this is a pretty big map that lets you either face off in the underground caves or out in the open with some good old vehicle combat. I think I found the droid's weak spot. Look, shooting them in the dick makes them literally shatter into pieces. I guess we're not that different after all. The last level in the clone campaign is another Kashyyyk map, this one looking exactly like the beach battle from Revenge of the Sith. I guess the developers must have been given access to the film. And just like in the film, you play alongside the Wookiees. This map does seem a bit unfair. Look, the droid central command post has three tanks, two spider walkers, a bunch of speeder bikes. Meanwhile, what do we have? Chewbacca and his mates? Now, two decades later, these levels may seem a bit basic, but every one of them is designed to allow for at least a few different attack vectors. Don't you just love the satisfying moment when there's only one enemy left and you and the entire crew are just hunting him down? There he is, hiding behind the wall. Now, having been released before episode 3, the Clone Wars ends with the Phantom Menace celebration. If only they knew. Okay, moving on to the Galactic Civil War. And once again, we start as the bad guys playing as the Empire on Tatooine. Hey guys, wait for me! Actually, never mind. See, that there is exactly why the clones were better. Now, this is one of those rare levels with three different factions. We've got the Rebels, the Imperials, and the Tuscans. Just uh, watch out for the Sarlacc pit. Oh, looks like the Tuscans have left their washing out. Don't you hate it when you're just a few steps away from the TIE fighter and then some plonker just takes it? Look, he crashes it straight away. These stormtroopers are worse than the Gungans. Ah, finally, a TIE fighter of my own. Let's show him how it's done. Okay, you know what? I take it all back. Okay, let's try that again. Wait, this X-Wing is just doing circles and firing randomly. Next up, we have the Streets of Moss Eisley. The Empire Special Class is the Dark Trooper, and I've always had a love-hate relationship with these. Leaping over the buildings with a jetpack was great fun, but their little tripod pistol thing is just terrible. I guess they had to balance out the classes. Ah, Lord Vader, lead the way. And of course, he heads straight to the pub. It's nice to see that every movie level will have at least a couple of Easter eggs from the films. Look, Jabba's sail barge is having its service is done. We then get another Renval level, this one set in the ancient temple. And these tight corridors and tombs really make for some nice close quarters combat. This is followed by two Yavin levels. The first is a chaotic free-for-all in the ruins, while the second has you playing as the rebels in and around the temple. Look at this poor Wookiee's face. Ah jeez, how did I get mixed up in this? I'm supposed to be celebrating live day back at home. Little does he know, he's got a squatter. Next up, Hoth, and this is one of the biggest maps in the game. And many players actually consider this this version superior to the one we end up getting in the sequel. Oh hey, it's Luke! Hey, where are you going? The land speed is back there! This is another map with a bunch of details from the movie. We've got the Tantans, the shield generator, the falcon in the hangar, and the control rooms from Echo Base. And of course, international law dictates that every Hoth level must have a snow speeder harpooning an 8080 feature. And this version is a lot more accurate to what we get in the movie. You can't fly and harpoon the walker on your own. You need to have two people on board, one to pilot, and the other for the harpoon. Okay, what's next? Ah yes, Bespin, the Cappuccino Planet. The first Bespin level is set in the city and this is a great map filled with both tight corridors and wide open areas that are perfect to snipe your enemies. 
The second map is the famous platforming level. Ah, nice, I'm gonna get myself an X-Wing. Ah, great, the Kmar Chewbacca got there first. Finally, take that, you Imperial scum. Whoa, what the hell? I don't believe it. Look, another X-Wing just crashed into me. You never saw that in the Rogue Squadron games. Damn it, it's happened again. And again. I'm not sure if these maps are a bit too small for starfighters or if the AI is just terrible. And naturally, the game's final map is the Battle for Endor, where you can destroy the shield bunker. You also get Ewoks as allies with their endless supply of spears and rocks. Look at this one just deciding to wave the battle out behind the tree. Well, I guess time to see if the developers were true to their promise. Yep. See, the trick to this level is to sneak around the side of the battle when no one can see you, then you can attack the shield generator. Why didn't Han Solo do that in the first place? In fact, why doesn't every general ever do that? Now that's it for the original levels, but there was also a Jabba's Palace map added as free DLC after launch for PC and Xbox. The Gamorrean guards act as the neutral faction in this one, and for some reason they do a little bow every time you shoot them. We also get the big man himself, who is invincible. I like how they place some fruit just out of his reach. Also, I've never actually seen Jabba from behind, so I didn't realize he's actually sitting in this giant baby walker. If you step on the trap door, you do fall into the Rancor pit and inadvertently get eaten. Look at my brave NPC teammates following me right to the jaws of death, unlike that Ewok. This is a very compact map, so command posts can change hands very quickly. But really, this stage is all about the Easter eggs from the movies, apart from Jabba and the Rancor, we've got Han and Carbonite, and the poor droid that it's destined to be tortured for an eternity. Plus, we've got a few new areas like a Jabba's Jacuzzi. Ugh, I probably shouldn't have touched the water. And Jabba's Vape Corner. Now, the developers also created mod tools for the PC version, which allowed the community to create some really nice custom maps like this Coruscant stage. But my favorite was always the movie-accurate battle for Naboo, mainly because you can play as the Gungans. And we've got all your favorite soldier classes. Yellow Gungan, Orange Gungan, and Blue Gungan with a rocket launcher. And to be honest, their dialogue doesn't exactly scream Braveheart. Lisa go boom now. Oh, Murray, Murray. Lisa gonna die. Ah, this is great. It's a big map. We've got the dinosaurs with the shields on one end, the droid dropships on the other, and absolute chaos in between. And there is something rather unnerving about seeing all these Gungans with guns. Now, of course, a big part of the Battlefront experience was always the multiplayer. And to be fair, this game's sequel is the one that would go on to be the most synonymous with great Star Wars multiplayer. But I think the original Battlefront still deserves recognition for building the foundation of things to come. The console version has local split-screen multiplayer, although it's only two players and it's limited to instant action. There is no multiplayer galactic conquest yet, which in itself is a lot smaller in scope than the second game. And the split-screen resolution does take a nosedive, as was very much the case for many sixth-generation games. But this game's big feature was, of course, the online multiplayer, which was available on all platforms with 32 players on PC and Xbox and 16 on PlayStation 2. For many of us, the original Battlefront really was that first standout online experience. I still have great memories of rushing back home from school and trying to liberate the Bespin platforms with my friends instead of doing homework. Unfortunately, it is difficult to show the heyday of this game's online multiplayer when it did happen two decades ago. The original servers were shut down in 2010, but were brought back for the game's Steam re-release in 2019. But as expected, they're pretty empty. I tried a few times, but never got more than five people on any one map. But hey, at least this game did get updated to run on modern hardware, unlike so many other LucasArts gems of that time. Which means you can still get a few friends together and liberate Bespin for old time's sakes. And so there we have it, the original Star Wars Battlefront, two decades later. So does it still hold up? Well, understandably, the online multiplayer isn't what it used to be, and the NPC AI definitely leaves more to be desired. But at its core, Star Wars Battlefront, it's still a damn good time. Pandemic Studios put together a fun sandbox spanning all of our favorite saga moments, filled with vehicles, ships, and invincible Bart stupid Jedi. And it built the foundation for one of the best Star Wars games ever made. But that's a topic for another video. In the meantime, please let me know your thoughts, experiences, and memories of the original Star Wars Battlefront. As always, thanks for watching, please consider supporting me on Patreon, and a big thanks to all my existing patrons. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.